Hi, I'm Emily, the Major Tim Space Ambassador Program Mentor. Hi, I'm Eva Agavendra, the Major Tim Dot Space Stem for Her Young Ambassador for 2022 to 2023. Um, today we are interviewing Jerry Griffin. Could you please introduce yourself, Jerry? Yeah, I'm Jerry Griffin. I'm a former flight director in mission control for all of the Apollo missions and uh, am now uh, very, very happy to be sharing some of my stories and answering your questions uh, about Apollo and, and anything else you want to talk about. Uh, so if you've got questions, fire away. Okay. So um, my first question would be about um, how you, when you were helping recover the astronauts from the, like helping the astronauts from the Apollo 13 mission land, um, I was wondering kind of how it felt to be kind of responsible for making sure that they were safe and how that made, like kind of how you coped with that situation. Yeah, um, you know, Apollo 13 was thrust upon us uh, in a way that that no failure we had ever had before uh, came on us. It was so sudden, and we were so far away um, that, that it was, uh, at first look, it looked kind of a little bit impossible. But we never talked about not getting them back. We just went to work. And it brought out something that I think is really important. Um, space flight is, is tough. It's risky. Um, and what you've got to do is never give up. Uh, what we did in Apollo 13 is we kept options uh, alive that would help us if some other option didn't work. We kept, we started thinking well in advance that we had to have a number of solutions. So it was really, a, it was probably mission control and the ground, the rest of the ground people, it was probably their finest mission because we, we actually uh, just hung in there, never, as I say, we never talked about them not coming home, uh, and that's where the failure is not an option uh, mm. came came about. It actually came about as part of the Apollo 13 movie, but that's okay. It uh, it fit. Mm. So anyway, that's one. That's that's probably the toughest mission we faced. Mm. Eva, would you like to ask the next question? Okay. Um. <clears throat> I have read that you've worked in like a lot of different areas, um, like military, flight director, mm. acting, and technical advisor, and so many other different things that some of them I don't even understand. Mm. So of all these careers, which is your favorite one and why? Oh, the favorite. That's hard to pick. <laughs> the, uh, you know... Let me go back a little bit in my career. When I was, when I before I got to NASA, I was um, involved in military aircraft, and that was that was fun, and it was very very. Um, let me say, uh, it really it was hard because it was in the atmosphere. You're going very fast, and you, airplanes who were going fast. In a way, space was a little bit easier because once you got above the atmosphere, you're in this weightless, uh, no atmosphere, and that was that way all the way to the moon. And so space flight, in a way, had some easy parts to it. And, but, but I really think the, the, uh, the airplane uh, experience got all of us ready to know what. Now, the only thing is there had been a lot of aircraft tested, but there hadn't been anything gone to the moon until we did it on Apollo 8 and landed the first time on Apollo 11. So 
of all those missions that we did, I think the one that to me was the most satisfying, and this may surprise you, was Apollo 8. Um, because it was the first time we had left Earth uh, mm -hmm. to go to the sphere of influence of somewhere else, the moon. And mm -hmm. uh, that was an exciting, exciting moment. Now, it was very exciting on the first landing and the second and the third and the fourth and all of those. But that Apollo 8 mission, um, essentially it ended the space race and it got us on our way to landing on the moon. That's a long answer to a short question, but, but I wanted it's to work right. all of that in there. Uh, okay, then. So kind of building off of that, I wanted to ask how has the missions changed how has the technology that you used in the missions changed over time yeah um, and that's an excellent question because what we had in the in the 60s and 70s when we went to the moon uh, was by today's standards it was really really poor it was state-of-the-art mm -hmm. at the time and it was adequate because we did it and we could use it but it was very hard to it was hard to set up the control center it was hard to set up the spacecraft everything was more difficult today with the digital technology that we have just like this this uh interview we're having now uh operating a spacecraft and operating in mission control has become much much easier um it's a lot of touch screen uh, not so many uh, instruments that you almost had to be a genius to figure out where they all were and what they did. Um, mm. It's consolidated, simplified. I think as time goes on now, we're going to see more artificial intelligence start to creep in. Um, and obviously, when we go to Mars, which will should be in your lifetime, um, we're going to have to have onboard systems that are much more maintainable by the astronauts because mm -hmm. at Mars, it's roughly 20 minutes it takes to get a, a word spoken on the Earth to Mars and 20 more minutes to get it mm -hmm. back. So you don't have a lot of real-time uh, information either way uh, when you're at distances like Mars. Now, you can operate mm -hmm. okay at the moon. But we've got to learn and take this new technology that you mentioned and learn how to operate at those greater distances in the future. But the technology today is great. I go into mm. the control center in Houston and I'm amazed wow. what they can do really fast. And uh, uh, because they can change things, we couldn't do that. It, it, it was hard to make changes uh, once you lift it off. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a different day in space uh, from now for the future. Uh, really, already is. Eva, would you like to ask the next question? Okay. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to study aeronautical engineering? Well, that's a, also a good question because, you know, most of us, go by role models we we have people that we see and know and and are around and we tend to the ones we like we we tend to follow those well i had an older brother i had a twin brother too both have passed away now but but uh, i had an older brother he was he was nine and a half years older and when World War II started, um, he had just graduated from high school and he enlisted in the Air Force. So that was my first time when I can remember, you know, my brother Ken is going to fly in an airplane, you know, and how do they do it? You know, I was about 10 years old and uh, by that time and almost 10, I was nine. And so I asked the question of myself, how do airplanes fly? 
and mm. uh, there wasn't much information available, but I watched Ken through his career um, flying airplanes and they fascinated me. So I started building models and things like that. Well, guess what? When I graduated from high school and it was time to go to college, um, I chose Texas A&M University because Texas A&M at that time was an all military school, just males, no females. And, um, and you could get a commission uh, in the military and get a degree in engineering. And it so happened they had one in aeronautical engineering. They had that degree. So I went to Texas A&M and graduated as an aeronautical engineer. Notice I said aeronautical because today I would go mm. and it'd be aerospace. But when I went to college, there was no space curriculum. Oh. Um. In fact, we had to learn what an orbit was after I got to NASA. Learn what an orbit was and how it worked and what it, how you did it and all that. But back to your original question, the reason I, it was because of my brother, my older brother, uh, who became a pilot in World War II. He didn't make it to England. Um, he was a little bit young. He was about to go to England when the war uh, ended, and um, um, so anyway, he was he was a neat guy. So this is kind of um, like a similar question, I suppose. But this is about um, as you were like a technical advisor for some films. How important do you think these films are? Do you think they're actually useful for educating or do you think it's mainly to inspire and interest young people in space? And you're, you're well, all of the above. I, I think, um, I, let me take a couple of things. For one thing, the availability of, of participating in space, in space activity is growing very quickly. The commercial companies are causing a lot of that because they need people and they they really are and I don't mean this in a in a discriminatory way. They're looking for young people. They want people that have skills like you will grow up to have uh, when you're ready to go join the workforce. Um, so so the the availability of, of positions in the space business, still with NASA, still with ESA, still with all of the governmental thing, but the commercial sector is really bringing on some new uh, space, let me call it, for people to work in. And they're mm -hmm. looking for good young people. I, I was not too long ago at the control center at uh, SpaceX, which is actually in California. Um, and eventually they'll have a control center here in Texas when they launch the, the, uh, the Starship. But that control center out there, although it was the technology we were talking about earlier, the people in it looked just like we did in 1965, 66. There were all these young people sitting on the edge of their chairs, excited to be doing what they're doing, um, and and really good. They were really good at what they do. So I think the future holds well for that, and I hope it, it'll be better. It'll be a lot better than what, what we experienced in the 60s and 70s. Um. So here's another question, sorry for taking a second question in a row, but it's another one about the movies. Um, the movie. Out of all the films that you've worked on, which one has been the best that you've worked on and why was that? Oh, okay. I think it's a toss up between, it's a toss up between Apollo 13 and contact. Um, 
Apollo 13, of course, I had the chance. I knew the story already, and I had mm -hmm. the chance to work with Jody Foster or with uh, with uh, Tom Hanks and 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 with Ron Howard, the director. And golly, what great people uh, they were! And they really wanted to do it right. Uh, mm -hmm. and they, <laughs> the director Ron Howard, told me more than once. He said, I'm not making a documentary. I'm making an entertaining film. I want it technically mm -hmm. correct, but I've got to have the ability to put in some emotion. He, he was worried that, he said, I've listened. He told me that he said, I've listened to all the voice tapes and all. He said, you guys didn't even sound like you were excited. And there wasn't much emotion going on. And we said, well... We weren't scared. We were trained to to react, but but we we just kept plugging along, and and that's what we were there for. So he finally got it. And but the Apollo thirteen movie, uh, he got technically he had it uh, correct. Contact was a different story. Contact was a movie based on a book called Contact by mm. Carl Sagan, who is the world-renowned astronomer that did a lot of TV back in the 80s, 90s, uh, and he died while we were making that film. But it was fiction, but it had a deep story to it. And if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen Contact, uh, watch it. And it's Jodie Foster plays the lead. And she was a delight to work with. She was so intelligent. So, you know, she graduated from Yale University, one of our top universities. And she was extremely, extremely sharp. And, and she, would, she became a good friend. Um, and, and the movie had some terrific sets in it. Uh, I got to really see for the first time, I got to see Hollywood uh, make believe uh, looked like it was real, and um, but it, contact was a deeper story in in the fact that you had to think about it, and that's what Carl Sagan, the astronomer, was trying to get you to do: is what would life be like on another star, yeah, and around, um. and it it uh, very very interesting. But it was a fun it was a fun movie to make. Before we move on to Eva, again, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to point out quickly the director chairs that are behind you. And I just wanted to ask if those are from the movies that you advised for. The director chairs that are behind you. Are they director chairs? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking to Eva. The, the no. Chairs? Yeah. The chairs behind me? Yeah, right. That. This one is my chair that I had, my name's on the back of all four of these. I did four oh. Let me see if I can maybe, uh, I'll try to show you. There's four of them there. And uh, the first one is Apollo 13 on the left. And then that's the Deep Impact was the one where the fiction uh, had to do with uh, uh, going up and splitting a, an asteroid that was about to hit the Earth. And uh, that was with Robert Duvall, who, that was a fun movie. And then Contact is that is the next chair. And then uh, Apollo 18 uh, was a <laughs> very interesting movie. It was, uh, it started out normal like it was going to be a, a legitimate Apollo 18. Um, and then it turned into paranormal and got really weird. Um, oh. And uh, it had Russians on the moon and <laughs> bodies and all kinds of things. Anyway, <clears throat> we filmed that. That was filmed in Canada. And, mm. uh, and it was so cold. They had this, they had this huge... Um, building 
I think it at one time had been a warehouse and there was no heat in it and it was winter time mm -hmm. and we were in there filming for about four weeks and it was miserable. <laughs> I've never been so cold in all my life. But it was, it was, I met some interesting Canadian actors and uh, American actors too, but, but uh, it made some good friends. But it was kind of a, it was a weird movie. And, uh, <laughs> but they paid me well and I enjoyed, they wanted, it looked like a NASA spacecraft and it looked like a NASA suits and all. That's all um, that's really what they used me for was making sure everything looked um, right. And, uh, so it's not the plot that they wanted, but more just the visual. Yeah. Right. right. It was fun. It was, mm -hmm. but it was far, far, out. <laughs> far out. Eva, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah. How is the acting experience different from being a flight director? How, how did it feel to be and, and how it is? What did it take and that kind of thing? It, I think is what you're asking. Is that what you're getting at? It, let me assume it is. Maybe I'll cover it if I did. Um, flight director is a very interesting position because it's like, it's, if you know what a, like a symphony, it's the conductor of a symphony. You're not playing any of the instruments anymore You've been pulled out. I was pulled out of, of playing an instrument, <laughs> if you will, in mission control, um, and made a flight director. Well, you can no longer, um, since you aren't playing the music, or in this case, actually analyzing the data, you have to be like an orchestra or a symphony conductor and listen to all of these inputs. And it really does. It takes a little bit of different kind of skill to listen to as many as five conversations at once and make sense out of them. Not that they're all talking to you. So maybe one or two are talking to you, but there's other talk going on in the background. I could listen to four or five conversations and get most of it out of them. And then the flight director has to make the final decision. There's nobody else on the ground for instance, if you're going to make a go, a go no go decision, you got to either go or you're not for a translunar burn that's going to send you to the moon. All of the inputs are taken by the flight director, and he's the guy that finally says, "We're go, we're go for TLI, translunar injection, and we're headed for the moon," and the crew performs. It. So it's a it's a big responsibility. Um, and you have a lot of help. You don't do it by yourself because you've got all of these inputs. But at the end of the day, you've got to make, you've got to be decisive. You can't just talk about it. You've got to make a decision. And to me, that's what you're learning now um, about space and about its critical thinking and making decisions and coming up with solutions. And Anybody that goes through STEM education of any kind, through science and technology and engineering and math and all that, that's what they learn. They learn how to logically think through prob problems, get them solved, and make a decision. Um, so that's what a flight director does. I was, I was the sixth flight director chosen at NASA and the last one chosen because we've had space shuttle, space station, getting ready for, for Artemis to go back to the moon. Uh, the last one chosen, I think, was number 98. So there, there have been 98 flight directors, and there have been a lot more astronauts than flight directors. Mm -hmm. They're more rare than, than astronauts. But uh, it, it was a great honor. Uh, to to be in that position, uh, it was super. Um, <clears throat> um. So for the what was the for your first experience being a flight director, 
kind of what was how 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 was your first experience as being a flight director, and like was it kind of like intimidating? Yeah, the ba the best the best I can express there, I think, is <laughs> the perfect day for the flight director was when there were no problems. Um, mm. But I I think we had Sophia. Every flight had problems. Some were just nagging little problems, and a bunch of them. Mm. Some were major. Uh, you know, we almost didn't land on Apollo 14 because of a problem. We almost didn't land on Apollo 16. And I was flight director for both of those uh, landing uh, because we had problems in lunar orbit. So I think what you, what you really strive for is calmness. And, uh, and I know that may sound funny, but but one of the things that a flight director did, and I always felt good when I was able to do that, when you have these problems to keep everyone calm, thinking, no panic, no wringing of hands, just do it. And um, I think the leader, in this case, the flight director, is the one that, that, that can make that happen. Uh, by their own actions, they don't. None of us ever acted like we were scared, and you know, we really were scared. Wasn't the right term. I told Ron Howard that on Apollo 13. Uh, fright was not the right term. Startled sometimes, but that's about it. And uh, mm -hmm. so I don't know whether I answered your question or not, but but uh, I think you did. Okay, good. Um, Okay, I'm sorry. Can I ask a second question as well? Okay, um, I'm going to have to uh, call this off fairly soon. I got to be somewhere else at 11. Okay, I'm sorry, Eva. Would you like to ask a question? Is that okay for us? It's fine. You can do it. Okay, so this is my next question is kind of like, do you kind of have to like detach yourself emotionally from the mission a bit to be able to maintain that calmness? Yes and no is the answer to that question. Um, you can't, we always knew that, for instance, the astronauts' lives were always on the line. And that, our, our main, our main first concern, not maybe not main all the time, but our first concern was always their safety. And, um, mm -hmm. And you tried not to get personalities into that, but we couldn't help it because mm -hmm. all, all of those uh, guys were friends. And uh, we lived close to each other. Our kids went to school together. Um, we partied together. We had, you know, it was, it was kind of like a huge family. And mm -hmm. some astronauts we were much closer to than others. Mm -hmm. uh, like Al Worden, we were very close to, and I know he was uh, significant in Major Temp. Um, uh, Charlie Duke is still a very, very close friend, Dave Scott. But my point in all that is, is that you couldn't detach yourself completely. I think I may have done as good a job at that as anybody. You kind of had to on occasion. And part of that reflects back to my military flying days because I saw, I saw guys die in airplane crashes. Um, or I was with them one morning and that afternoon they had been killed, you know. So, and you build, you don't, you don't ever get over that, but you build a scar tissue that says it usually goes, it causes first anger. What happened? Could I have made a difference? Mm. And we saw we're going to fix this. And then you finally relax when you fly again and fly successfully. So I go through all that mainly to tell you that human spaceflight does involve humans. And I think it's hard to separate uh, that they're just 
an astronaut or just a flight controller or just what an engineer they're they're all in this human feeling and you you, you can't mm -hmm. distance yourself you can you can push it a little bit but you can't get rid of of that feeling that uh, this is family we would have we would have fought and died for each other uh, it was like brothers and sisters in the same family and uh thank goodness we finally got a lot more females in the business now we we were studied in our day we didn't have uh women in the control center oh they, they were there but they were more support roles and one of the problems was is that none of the women there are very very few women um studied technical issues or got degrees in electrical engineering or aeronautical engineering or um, we had some physicists but they were invaluable in the design of what we were doing and so we didn't have any women in the control center until shuttle and uh, then it became uh, we opened up the other half of the workforce and now the control center is more than half uh, women uh, compared to men so it's all come around and uh, mm -hmm. and for the better could we squeeze in one more question from eva sure um what is your message for young children who want to have a space career if it's all about to me a space career or a career in anything really if you're going to really be good it's all about education uh and that's where it starts and you know what not everybody that studies engineering goes into the, our science uh, math not everyone goes into the space business but that's where we get most most of them from that pool but uh, if if space doesn't interest you or you decide to go in a different direction that's fine uh, but the education is is the big Part. In my day, we were mostly at NASA, we were mostly bachelor degree, we call it here. That's first level degree of, of university. Um, today, there's still a lot of first level graduates there, but there are many more second level, which we call a master's degree, or even mm -hmm. the third level, the doctorate, the PhD. Uh, uh, degree and a lot of the astronauts have advanced degrees so the education level to get into the space business has has generally risen um, we had <laughs> most of us were right out of college and pretty young I had the time in the military so by the time I got there I was one of the older people and I was 25 um, we had people there that were 21, 22, in the control center, manning mm. the mission. So, well. so anyway, my point is, uh, Eva, the, the it all starts with education, and you got to get that. If you get that established, then there's no telling where you can go. You could do space or anything else. Thank you for coming and joining um, our interview. Really nice, Emily and, and Evie, to talk to you. Um, my sound system is not as clear as it once was. I'm going to have to change it out. And um, on the speakers, I've got a headset that's really good. But but uh, I, I know I missed a couple of your questions, but and I'm sorry about that. But uh, I may not have hit them right on. Um, but It's okay. You were very, very interesting to speak to. Okay, well, thank you, both both of you, and I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It was really interesting speaking to you. Oh, well, good. I'm glad you liked it. Okay.